Right, Jim, uh, it's great to be here at Jim and the Mills. I'm um, here with John. the man himself, Jim. Uh, Jim, before we sort of chat about the mill, um, I'll just ask you a little bit about, I suppose, your own childhood, where you grew up and your family, and I suppose how that would have shaped you and influenced you. Right. I grew up uh, in near Tullus, in a place called Siskin, um, just about two miles out from the town. Um, grew up there, two brothers. Anthony and John, both older than I am, and uh, uh, we had an Aunt Mary there. My father's, my father's um, sister lived with us occasionally. She used to alternate between the mill here, where her brother was living, and our house uh, in Siskin. And um, also, um, Jim, my uncle that was here, would have been born down in Siskin. My grandfather went down from here and married a Purcell woman. Uh, a porcel woman down in Siskin, whose family, the previous generation, had also gone down from Upper Church. They were from Gort Kelly, okay. and they were porcel family. So he married in there, and then eventually, my uncle Jim came up here as a child, and uh, eventually he left the place to me. We grew up down there in Siskin. We had a great whole life, full of kind of carefree living, uh, the farm, and our lives were kind of filled with with um, the farming and all the pastimes we had as young fellas, mm. uh, up and down the road to our neighbours, the Whalens, and there was a whole crowd of young fellas around, and there was our neighbours, our neighbours, um, nearest neighbours were Hades, and we had neighbours down the fields, Tierneys, and, and uh, down the other side then we had Burks and Corcorns and Herties, and uh, so a lot of young lads around, you know, bigger families maybe, although there were only three in our family, and three in the Whalens, we call them, and uh, they were mostly our haunts as young fellas, and there was other people up the road, the Meehans, and they all interacted with each other, playing games and doing various, you know, uh, pastimes, you know, everything, and we grew up with sport, mostly. Um, uh, there was greyhounds around, people had greyhounds, ran, ran in Tullis track and uh, then following racing and soccer and hurling and football. Our lives were filled with that, mm. with, with, with that kind of, uh, and I suppose uh, uh, going to the creamery and the fairman was a big thing when we were young. Um, but what was the what was the the culture around the creamery and, and going to the creamery? It was it was a staple of country life, really, wasn't it? It was. You see, everyone was going to the creamery. People hadn't as many cows, and uh, an average herd of cows would be maybe seven or eight or ten or fourteen would be a very big herd of cows back in in uh, even down our country now, where uh, twenty would be an enormous herd of cows right. back in the sixties. Very few people, because. Fairman was a mixed tillage. Um, they'd keep a few cattle on to sell, and uh, um, the cows, of course. And uh, there were people weren't well off, but they weren't badly off. Mm. They were comfortable enough, and all was aspiring to be to improve, you know, uh, in the farm. And things were getting better, I suppose. Uh, um, the tractors were coming into being. The horse was going out. And it, going to the creamery was ass in cares and pony in cares, depending on the women went to the creamery. Many women went um, uh, went to the creamery in my time. I went into the creamery myself for, for years with horses. And uh, we had a pair of horses at home. My father used to plough and, and till with the horses. And, and um, then the tractor came into being. And, um, so life changed. Kind of, I'd say the seventies was the big transformation, right? You know, and the creamery was a, obviously it was a place of work, but I say it was where the stories were exchanged and news was spread. Was it? Oh yeah, but sure, they were coming from all corners of the parish. In Tullis now, when we were going to the creamery, people would come in from up Killine and Luke, all around, um, out Luke, British, then out the far side of the town from the Furs and Loch de Gala side, in Pierce Town all out around to Tortola, Knock Row, and back out to Holy Cross. Okay. So the whole place was, and Ballycale, some of the people in Ballycale were coming, 
their milk was collected. And so it was a great place of, of, of talk and exchange of news yeah. and be talking about the day's events um, all the time, you know. Politics, as it said in the song, one day, talking politics is, and horses and the weather and the crops. And um, that was the staple thing. Then going home from the creamery, people were going for a few messages into the shops. Yeah. There were a lot of small shops around and you, you could you had your choice of shops. You could, we could go home by Carmickstown as well. We had two roads out of Tullis. We could come out by Killinan or out by um, Carmickstown. And if we, we used to deal in a house called Connie Carew's. Connie Carew's now um, was in Fire Street where Super Value is now and a lot of the country people dealt there and you could buy your messages on teak. Okay. You know, credit. Mm. And uh, so I could go in there going up from the creamery and get a few messages that my mother might have told me bring home and there was no payment. And then there were smaller shops where you would buy different things and so it was a grand old lifestyle. Mm. Easy going. Was it yeah, the pace of life a little gentler, was ah, it? Ah sure it was, it was, yeah. And uh, when you were young, of course, you're boisterous and mad to get on with things. And um, in a hurry, especially going to the creamery, you'd be racing the horse. And, and, uh, and the donkeys with the older people would be going slow, maybe walking or bare trot along the road. And people took it easy. Yeah. And they enjoyed going to the creamery, I think. Yeah. And of course, the fairs were just, were still there when I was young. The fairs were still in Tullis. The I think it was... Uh, on the Monday, and then there'd be a horse fair um, once a month, you know. Yeah. The horse fair was held above the cathedral there, uh, up there. That was where the horse fair, they congregated there. But the cattle fair was all around, all over the square. Okay. And they used to put up the shutters to protect the doors. It was a great day for the pubs. Yeah. And many's the row, uh, particularly before my time, but they tell you of all the rows that took place over between dealers and people trying to pull a fast one. And, right. Do you know all those old stories? And r there were many a court case in Sud, I think, after after a day at the fair. Okay, right. Yeah. The ash plants were in vogue. And All right. There'd be groups of people maybe against each other. Okay. And an odd fight down the town. Right. And especially in the drink attitude. Okay. It's so it was helter skelter. It was. It was a helter skelter. <laughs> Was. Uh, you mentioned you know sport was a big part of your life uh, as a kid, and you were a fine hurler yourself, and you would have played with some fine hurlers too. So. Yeah, oh god, sure, I played with Sarsfields, mm. and uh, Jimmy Doyle was still going strong. Sean McLaughlin, you know, great men who won all Ireland's great compet, always fierce competitors, mm. even in training, they hated to be beaten. Right. You know, and uh, you know, players maybe that weren't as well known, club players, very good, very good hurlers. Um, on the maybe on the pint of the county, but never. Paul Byrne played there. He won in Ireland seventy one. They played with me, but Jimmy, of course, was was the most brilliant hurler of them all. Mm. He had this incredible um, control. And Paddy Doyle was a wonderful hurler. His brother mm. Paddy, master hurler, and many very Tullis was full of good hurlers. And that great team of the fifties and sixties, they were still kind of the end of them or. That was the end of their reign. Jimmy had played with them from about 1956 when he was came straight off of the minors. But um, McLaughlin, uh, Tony Wall was a master hurler. I didn't play with him. He was gone before I came. Bobby Mokler, there was three canes, mm. great players. Um, just I played with Blackie. Blackie played a bit on, on I'd say. Blackie was the goalie. Great hurler altogether. Tremendous. Rocky McElgun. All those people, um, um, terrific holders, the Murphys, Michael mm. and Noel, Sean, three brothers. Then you had Dick Hallen and the Luke, and uh, later the, in later years, the Durneys, Burton and Patsy. They were marvellous players. Musha Mayer. Mm. And um, oh, they had lots of players, TJ Simple. They were wonderful sticksmen and great grafters too. Some mm. of the players were, were they were... They did the work. They did the hard work. Mm. The, the, that's the Arsene team of the, of the 50s and 60s used to play in the churches tournaments down in Cork. And they were almost an unofficial All-Ireland. For lengths of suits and things like that. Oh, yeah. And, oh, yes. Yes, gold watches and mm. all that sort of stuff. 
and of course there were great teams here back before a little bit before my time. Borland had, still had a great team. Borough Sali with the Kinneys and all, all the, the Rhines and all the, the great hurlers, Devaney coming on, and uh, the great Borland team was just coming to its end. Mm. And uh, um, Borough Sali, the Sarsfields, uh, Holy Cross of course had a great team. They came in the in the late forties. Pat Stakelam and John Doyle and Mick Mayer, the Mayors and a great team, Bannons, uh, a great, great team of hurlers there. And they were to talk about those suitlings and uh, mm. which was very prized uh, mm. um, team to win. Yeah, probably yeah. like it's young people nowadays to hear that, you know, yeah. the chance of winning, you know, material to make a suit was yeah. a big deal, wasn't it? That's a big deal. <laughs> Twas was a great prize. Yeah. And then I suppose the you know, going off in the old bus and down to Cork and the tournaments and that was a big team. But you played against like the Black Rock and that. Yeah, we yeah. did. We oh, well, I uh, that that was almost over. Okay. It was when over. we did go down and we used, we used to go down every year to play Glen Rovers. Okay. And so Glen Rovers would come up every year, maybe play Sarsfields. I remember Christy Ring inside in the early sixties, and he'd never miss one of those matches. Okay. And he was as competitive as if it was in All Ireland. Uh, and those and Jimmy Dyle was the same. I remember old Torn playing playing uh, challenges against Glen Rovers and Black Rock and Finn Bears and those teams here in Tullas and uh, they were as keen to win as if it was a major uh, title. Yeah. Because they were all out they were competitive players. Yeah. And even in training I remember Dick Kellen and Sean McLaughlin, they'd cut lumps off each other. Even in training. Right. Yeah, there was nothing nothing given easily. I'd say you were competitive enough yourself. And now, I wasn't uh, too bad. What did hurling mean to you? Oh, I, so now when I was very young, John, it was, I think, the most important thing in my life. Okay. And we grew up with that tradition. Mm. I think hurlers were, were kind of, um, they were held in, in, in highest regard, uh, even though, you know, maybe, maybe too much so. Okay. They were really like gods. The county men were regarded as as nearly like mini gods. I mean, do you think that was because, I suppose, in a way, Ireland was a small, each county, each parish was a smaller place, people weren't travelling as far, so this was, this was the only show in town to a certain extent, was it? was, it? that was the pinnacle mm. you might reach, yeah. as, as because the international sport wasn't available, mm. there was no television, so the local men, the heroes, were, were they were the, the great players, mm. the people that were looked up to, and they were looked up to and admired by, by the pub. I'd say, you know, it was mostly uh, uh, um, on the men's side mm. uh, that, you know, sport and women didn't participate much that time. And um, so when you'd be talking, men would meet together on the night, they'd be talking about all these, these great players. And, and even beyond that, talking about great horses or dogs, they discussed mm. them forever. Yeah. And um, and the great athletes, like they'd be talking about uh, Pat O'Callan and Doctor Pat O'Callan, mm. and when they'd meet, and uh, about the, the the old boxers, right? They'd talk about Jack Johnson and Gentleman Jim Corbett as if they were down the road. Yeah, and they'd never have seen them only maybe maybe six months after or or old old newsreels. Yeah, in the cinema, they might go in to see them. But they talked about those, those Joe Lewis and Jack Dempsey, Gene Tunney, Primo Carnero, all the great boxers back along. We heard about them growing up, mm. lads discussing them. Yeah. Talking about the great racehorses then. There was a great racehorse back in the 30s, won the Gold Cup five times, Golden Miller. Right. And he won the Grand National. My father had often talked to Jimmy Tierney about him. They'd only have read about them. Yeah. But to them, they were the icons of their their world, yeah, you know, and religion like played a very big part in people's life, but but I'd say it was secondary, yeah, to their sporting, yeah, because I'd say that was their greatest interest in life. And what like what's interesting about that is it wasn't as nowadays you can go on a computer and find out, you know, a fact or whatever. But knowledge back then was a bit more hard earned. You had to, yeah. you had to, you had to be, I suppose. You had to be proficient in the art of conversation and the yeah. art of listening, maybe more importantly. Right. And of course, uh, they'd see it in a newspaper article. And, yeah. uh, they'd read that avidly. Yeah. You know, uh, um, 
uh, they'd read and they love to have that knowledge when they'd meet somebody yeah. up the road or down the road yeah. to be able to and we listened and all our neighbours all the younger lads be listening in awe to the older fellas you know who was a great hero of, of all the people around was Mick Mackey okay. yeah. and they talked even my father um, talked about he, he remembered um, I, he saw him playing as when he was very young there was a great player called Jim Kelleher of Dungorney okay. in Cork. He was at the time of Tom Simple. Yeah. And they'd be talking about the older, the real older generation would be talking about the, the great Kilkenny team that won seven All Irelands, the Sim Walton, the Rochfords, the Graces of Tullerone. They'd be talking and the, and the great Tobradora team. Mm-hmm. And then Borland came on with Johnny Lahey and Paddy Lahey and all that, Arthur Donnelly. They spoke about all those players and, and the great, even the old blues long ago. Okay. They talked about, the, we, we nearly knew those names offhand. Right. And grew up with all that around. And the greyhounds were a very important okay. feature. The, 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 the poor man's version of the horse, <laughs> okay. you know. So at least you could, if you had a good greyhound going coursing or going to the track, and uh, the Tierney's always, the later years, the Careys, the Killinan, Jerry Carey and they, that family, they had good greyhounds, okay. you know, um, and it was always aspiring to maybe have a very good dog that might win you the derby or go close, right. you know. And that would be big for the whole locality as, as much as for the person with the dog, wouldn't Almost it? Almost definitely, yeah. Everyone shared in that. Yeah. Everyone shared in the triumph. Yeah. It's like uh, even now on, on Sunday with Kelly Harrington. Yeah. Uh, you know, everyone is kind of becomes part of the whole, the whole celebration. Yeah. And it was that people uh, took joy, I think, in, 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 in living through the exploits of, of those great sportsmen. Yeah. You know. Uh, talk to me a bit about um, music and song because you would have grown up with it, I understand. Yeah, oh yeah, we did. My mother was used was used to play the piano, and and my mother went to school in England, so she was she grew up with the classical piano you know but she loved uh, she lo- she also grew up with the records of John McCormack and all that not alone that English kind of town hall music mm. so when she came home and uh, she'd be always telling me about songs and uh, and then we had a piano and she would win and play it on the piano and so we grew up with song and music as well not so much my father loved the old, the old tr- trad Okay. He'd love to hear Cayley House, those old programmes. Yeah. He'd, he'd love that. Uh, listen, there was only one programme a week on that time, um, Cayley House. Yeah. The radio was very limited, to you know, an hour in the morning, and okay. an hour at dinner time, and then a few hours in the evening. And it was only RT. Other than that, what they used to listen to was the BBC Light. Okay. Uh, there was a lot of nice music on that, a kind of light opera. People used to listen to that. Um, a certain cohort of people used to, to love, they were very into the opera. And if you'd meet in town now, certain pubs in Tullis, like Skehens Longwa, there in the corner of the square, that was a great house. It could burst into a singing session okay. uh, late in the night there when they all had a few pints right. taken. And there'd be a great sing song there. And was you, the Rattler Byrne, his family were. were oh, the, uh, Rattler used to play double accordion and the mouth organ. And, uh, going to matches. Yeah, they'd have a great session. He was a, he was an out and out character, like for, mm. for, fun, and he was always in great humour, yeah. and very, kind of witty, yeah. man. And they were full of it though. All that era, that team, they had so much success, and I suppose, it it it, it filled their lives too. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, they were filled with so they won so much, and they were winning with the county, winning with the club, and uh, they were confident people. And full of passion for the game, yeah. full of passion for music, and uh, as well as that, and um, and is the, is the mistake a lot of people do who didn't live through the era when they look back and say the nineteen fifties and sixties and think of Ireland as maybe a grey place, but yeah. it was full of colour. No, it wasn't such a grey place. Mm. I don't. It might have been a grey place. Statistics make it make it a grey grey place. Yeah. You know, I know about poverty. My mother lived in town. Was reared there. And um, she saw that over, but 
I knew I often I knew a lot of the people that came through that era and they won't tell you that they, they used to go out and catch rabbits mm. snare them they used to go out and fish in the rivers there was plenty of fish in the rivers and um, I remember the nigger, nigger Connors, the brother of Josh um, uh, he was telling me one Sunday we were waiting to go into Mass below he says only for the rabbits he says we'd have died of the hunger <laughs> <laughs> and of course he didn't really mean that yeah. I mean he was a fine big man himself and had a fine family but I remember him saying that you know they would and, and they were able to drink porter the men always seemed to have a few pounds for, for okay. the pint priorities <laughs> <laughs> the women might have been at home struggling to, to make the dinner but the men had the the men went out and and, and uh, now a lot of the, I, I remember all my neighbors at home I can't say any of them were were badly off people yeah yeah but they were they were they had enough yeah they had enough and what's more a lot of them kind of had a good old outlook particularly the country people um, they were always they saw things getting better mm. So uh, I'd say, you know, for many of the people that had to immigrate, many people had to immigrate, and I met many of them, they used to come home on holidays, but they, they, it didn't seem to diminish their, their love of their past, mm. do you know? Mm. They, didn't seem to, they didn't seem to think that they had a terrible time growing up, yeah, yeah. which is often perceived yeah. looking, looking back. Yeah, looking back. And in terms of music and your mum, uh, again, have you any, you know, really vivid early memory of the first time music was in your life or was it her playing the piano or you think back, what, what strikes you? <coughs> yeah, yeah, well, you see, another thing about it, not alone my mother, but people up and down the road, they were always singing bits of songs. Okay. Now, the words weren't readily avail available that time. Mm. People would be whistling tunes and... Um, that was one of my memories. People were always whistling. People that had a note in their head. Mm. And they'd be mad to learn the words of a song, but they couldn't get their they couldn't get their hands on the words. Many of them. Okay. And and um they'd, I remember my neighbours and say, That's a lovely song. I'd love to get the words of it. This would be maybe back in the late fifties now, you know what okay. I mean? And it was there were no song books readily available available like there are now. Okay. So, I mean, it was difficult. They might, some fella would say, I know that song. Mm. A fella might have only two or three songs in his repertoire. Okay. If he, there wasn't much singing in the pubs. Right. At all, at all. It wasn't as plentiful as you have. Now, some pubs never had a song. Okay. You'd nearly be hunted. <laughs> if you start, bear around Christmas or something. Yeah. Someone, when they were in Jolly Forum, might say, sing an old song. Yeah. And uh, it was down around... Certainly, um, most of the pubs I knew when I was young in Tullus, there were a certain p uh, crowd of people interested in the trad, and they weren't drinking people. Isn't it funny to say? Okay. Generally, they weren't they weren't drinking people at, at all. There was people interested in the in of course set dancing, but the set dancing nearly died out, okay. and then it made a great comeback. You know, the, you, down here you had the metal bridge long ago, and the platform there. I don't. I only remember seeing that there. I was never at it. I think that died out in the early, in the early 60s. And um, but we passed down here in that old time. We'd come up and down from Siskin here with the with the pony and trap. And uh, my father might come up to help Jim with a bit of hay or something here. And um, I remember passing down there uh, and people gathering, and all the people that. Your own cousins, Dantonese, my, my cousins and your cousins, uh, they talk of, with great memory of those times mm. um, down at the platform and the, the carefree sort of attitude and, and, going to the, and going to the river and all those yeah. things uh, to swim in, 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 in the old pool below there mm. under George Burke's I, I was never part of that. I wasn't here at the time. But I mean, uh, if you, you know, people... I don't believe it was as grey as people, mm. uh, and often people blot out those old things from their memories, yeah. the unpleasant things. Mm. But most of my childhood grown up, and I could say the same of the houses around me, we don't look back in it with unpleasant memories. Mm. They were mostly pleasant. And going to mass then was another big thing. Religion was a big thing. People were very, particularly the women. Mm. 
they were very, they had a very strong faith, and and was they kind of the men weren't as weren't as fanatical about it, mm. you know. Women did, and they had a. It was really they nurtured the the belief in their families, and the mass was a very big thing, uh, socially. Mm. People got to know everybody, you know. They were from every end of the town there in Tullas coming in, like the creamery, mm. among the farming community. And people knew nearly everyone. I could say I nearly knew everyone in Tullis, nearly every family. Mm. You know, there was very few families between school, school, school Hill, but there was about 550 pupils there in my time, from first class up, up to sixth. And, and um, so you got to nearly know, if you were interested in people. Mm. So you'd know a brother or, or, or of somebody, and, You'd know the bigger lads, and then there was Holland leagues there again. Mm. There was a junior league and a senior league, and there was great competition. And there was the boys then who had no interest in hurling. Nice. Like I remember Dennis O'Driscoll. He became a, a very well-known poet and a friend of Seamus. He was in my class. He was out from the Mill Road. Okay. And Dennis had no, but they'd be giving him a hurling and a few more lads that were academic minded. Right. They had no interest in the hurling, but they were trying to push the hurling on them. There was no football ever ever played yeah. in the school. You know, ever. it was never nurtured, no. It was all hurling. Um, they had no football teams. And of course, um, then when you moved on to the CBS, uh, the secondary, um, uh, hurling was a very important part of life there. Okay. You know, between the Pers white, yeah. all the, the rice cup and the white and the, the, the hearty, of course, was the pinnacle. And had you any particular Christian brothers there who really pushed it at the time? or Not, not in primary, no. No, no we, 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 had, we had one great teacher my, in sixth class in primary. That was Willie Dwyer below from, from uh, Drumbane. Willie was a great teacher. He'd have a fellow nearly ready for the, for the intercert leaving right you know when yeah, yeah. if you were interested yeah and uh, there was a lot of poor old fellas left back as they used to call it but they that's a, education at the time uh, you know there was you know there wasn't maybe the pathway that exists nowadays for people to follow an education i'm sure there was plenty of people who would have been perfectly suited for going to university but it just wasn't possible no it was a lot of people left mm. it was nearly a mark if you said he's left okay he's left school most of many of them left after primary and then they dropped out in the early years of secondary and then they might go up to the tech and do the group cert they called it okay. kind of a two or three year course there the, the intermediate wasn't available that time right uh, what's the junior now but that wasn't available fellas with a kind of a leaning towards uh, towards trades like carpentry or iron work, or yeah. weren't seen as good academically, even though many of the fellas that I knew that were didn't do well in primary school, they were very intelligent, did very well after. Okay. You know, yeah. and they just that school didn't suit them, that right. type of school. And there was 45 or 48 in our class, you know, yeah. varied up to, up to 50, because there was A and B. And I remember one year there was A, B and C. They had them in three different you know, there'd be out a hundred overall. There could be up to a hundred coming in every year to school in. Yeah. And um, they also had Luke, of course. Luke School was a small and Rahilty. Okay. Uh, they yeah. catered for kind of out that into the into the town, whichever end you were you were on. But it was a big school, and that was good. I never had. A, I hadn't any bad memories of, yeah. of primary school. I got an odd bill to the leather. Uh, you know, which I didn't mind too much. Uh, some teachers, I suppose you could call them, they were severe. Yeah. Uh, uh, severe on their pupils. More of them were, were easy going. Uh, if you didn't learn, they left you there. Okay. You know, yeah. it was more or less up to your, depending on the teacher. Yeah. You know, but generally speaking, um, I had no bad experience anywhere. You were talking there about uh, mass and religion and how it was much a social occasion, I suppose, as a religious one almost. I'd imagine you're meeting so many people on the roads, even on the way to mass. I know my uncle has spoken about this. Someone will give you a bar of a bike or you yeah. look, you get picked up in a car. But that was just, there was great conversation going there and coming back. Oh, there was. And, uh, and the preparedness 
for the women the night before they'd be shining shoes and making sure all their children were looking very well. Yeah. I'd say more in the rural parishes it was it was more apt than in a, in a, the likes of Tullis town. Mm. Um, because um, I, I even said I, I, I'd say it is a it is a big disadvantage nowadays for young people because everyone was going to mass long ago and they got to know each other. Mm looking at each other at mass or you as youngsters mm. and when they'd come home they might say who is that one or so they got to know everyone from from the f every end of the parish mm. um, it's particularly I'd say in rural and I, I think it's a big loss today uh, from a social point of view mm. people don't get to meet or know you know I'm sure there are people in one end of the parish above now that don't know say Gortahula as regards um, above around uh, Seskin, mm. you know those those opposite ends of the parish. Mm. Whereas long ago that wouldn't happen. Then funerals were different, and even Jim Dwyer was saying to me long ago, when people would go to a funeral long ago, they'd um, they'd come to the house where the corpse would be laid out, mostly at home. You know, mm. they were taken from the houses. They weren't there weren't any mortuaries or anything like that, and. Uh, um, he says all the people that would come to the funeral, every one of them would wait there until the hearse left. And they'd follow the hearse. You know, it wasn't just coming out into the, and shake hands with the people out the door and gone. Mm. It was a big event. And it was treated as such. I'm sure even up to, I, well, I suppose 25 or 30 years ago, when a funeral was passing the road, everyone would pull up and stop until the entire um, um, funeral procession had passed. Mm. That never happens now. You could meet a hearse down the road there now. Nobody stops and pulls in. Mm. It was just that they had different. They had a different kind of respect. Mm. Um, people had a different sense of respect uh, towards the dead. It and the traditions around death. Um, and I'd say they're probably still a bit stronger in Upper Church in many places, like digging the graves ourselves and yeah. the wakes and that. But that was very important as well, wasn't it? Oh, it was. That was part of the whole thing. It was a ritual. Mm. It was. Sure, the wake was was a big a big thing. You know, the wake at the house. And um, then it was nearly a three-day. And the digging of the grave and the drink, of course, was also came into it. Mm. For the men, anyway, digging mm. the grave. I remember in Killeen one time they were digging a grave, and that, um, there was one great Killeen man there. He, f I remember when the grave was dug, he fell head first down into the grave. He had too much to spare. <laughs> and had they pulled him out, he'd be, he'd be related to the great hurlers now okay. of today. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but he was, he was a grand man, but he capsized anyway. Into okay. The, into the, <laughs> down into the grave there, they were digging a grave in Killeen you know, and I was up at it myself uh, uh, just the evening before. I think it was, it was Jim Mayer of Killeen and Jim would have been a brother of Long Dinny. Right. I think it was his funeral okay. and they were digging the grave there and there was a nice crowd there. But the bottles of whiskey would be, would be flowing. Yeah. <laughs> and there was, yeah, the funeral was a big thing mm. and a very solemn, but also light-hearted in many ways mm. you know what i mean i suppose the man's life is celebrated yeah. in those situations That's right, yeah. whatever funny stories from yeah. his, his past are aired there again they are they are they're retold yeah and whether he was good or bad there wouldn't be a bad word spoken about him mm -hmm. on that night and yeah. <laughs> Um, talk to me about the mill and I suppose the history yeah. of the building and how far back it goes. Yeah, the, the mill was built, I'd say my great grandfather was Jim of the mill. He was the first man to live here uh, as a house, you know. Um, he would have lived here from the 1850s, maybe 1855. Now, his father was Anthony and his father before him built the mill about, started around before 1800, okay. the late 1700s. And uh, you know, it took a long time drawing stone and to build a house uh, like that at that time. And they built it, as you, as you see, down here near the river. Mm -hmm. It was never meant to be a dwelling house. Okay. So to, we were liable to flooding in that time. So it was built around that time. It was built originally as a mill. And then um, this road, 
along here, the Anglo Sea Line was um, upgraded around 1829 or 1830, and uh, they started the shop and the pub there around that time. Okay. And uh, the mill ran until about 1900. Uh, my grandfather, Frankie, brought me down a little docker there recently, Frankie Short, um, showing me the dimensions of the mill in about 18, the late 1840s or something. Oh. Lovely document. Yeah. How much they were paying to the landlord. Okay. And um, the size of the wheel, it, it depended on that. And uh, they had a sluice in above, you know, right. which brought in the water. And um, so um, the dimensions of the wheel, and it ran there at the back of the house. The only thing that's left, there's an old, the stones of the sluice, which is all filled in, are the, uh, the, the stones are there, the wall of the sluice. That's still in existence. So it was ran as a mill, grinding mostly oats. Okay. There wasn't much wheat going around. Right. There might have been a shear, you know, the, the land, of course, the hilly land. But yeah. there was good land also, yeah. mixed with a good and a fine land up there. I mean, if you go up a bit there, up in the height there, there's boggy and mixed land. But they'd have grown a bit of oats and ground that then into flour and, okay. and oatmeal for stirabout or porridge okay. at the time. Right. And um, then, I suppose, the mill, there, was no, there were no men here then. And um, the mill kind of... Uh, died out, right. bigger mills were, lot of, there were a lot of mills around, yeah. smaller mills, and they all died out in time. Uh, there was a mill down, a field of mills, you know, the yeah. Lowries. Yeah. There was a mill at Brits down there in Drumban. There was a mill up here long ago, in, uh, up near where Dimna, Dinny Rines is living okay. there. Um, there were several mills, and then Burke's mill kind of was, uh, Burke's below and Kyle Crew. Right. That mill, um, that, that worked away, I think, until the 50s, okay. maybe the early 60s. So um, they gave up the mill here anyway. They had a good, great business in the shop. Right. And they had all the people from around coming down. There was no metal bridge at the time. Right. Um, no shops or no houses there okay. at that time, you know. And then your grand-aunt opened the shop. Yeah. She um, did her trade and then the, the other shop opened, the Burks there at the metal bridge and slowly I suppose a place like this my uncle was here on his own and he still had a little trade um, and the pub was there all the time mm. going you know so I suppose the mid and old they had a great trade maybe on in the late 1800s up to up to um, the 1950s okay. and then it began to go downhill you know people started to go to towns and yeah. um, they got transported um, they had a bus service, of course, there, you know. Yeah. There was a great bus service. There was a two, and some days there were two buses going up and down there. One of them going to Tipperary, another one going to Kilcommon, the Hogan's bus service. And, okay. uh, there was a bus going to Drumban, through Drumban from Tullis going to Cashel. So there was a great way of, of going to the towns. And yeah. Transport improved. It was all horse long ago, I suppose. People walking down across the fields up there. We had them all in, we have all those in the old books in there. And, um, uh, so you have the ledgers from back in the we day? We had, there was about 130 or 40 customers here in the books. Okay, wow. From all over the, back up as far as Gortahula, up as far as Mokland, uh, over here as far as uh, where, and where Kelly is living now, Grady's Cross. Uh, all the Grady's were customers here. Um, Andrew Ryan of the castle, They're all back to Gort Kelly. They'd walk down across there, they needed a, um, a half sack of flour, which was 10 stone. And I saw there, and Greta did a lot of recovering of old dockets there recently. And uh, I saw there, they sold 32 10 stone bags of flour in a, in a month. You know, people yeah. would come and buy the flour. Yeah and take it home, but um, um, they used to buy from different wholesalers, okay. you know, in the, in the 30s and up to the 30s and 40s people were, were taking home flour, making their own bread. There was very little sale of bread from the bakeries. Right. That was mostly confined to the towns okay. and maybe a village, you know, yeah, yeah. people made their own cakes and 
they used the, the, the oatmeal then for stirabout, for porridge, as they used to call it, long ago stirabout. So they had a great trade here, a great business. And um, so, as I said, it just wore out with time. And you then, when did you, what I year did you I came up here, first? Jim died in 1981 and he left, the, he left this place to me. There's a bit of land down below. It was uh, down a mile down the road there in Balaboy with with the farm, uh, with this house, mm. and a bit of land here at, at the house. So I came up here. Uh, there was a danger of the license being lost okay. through this kind of a new thing that came out. A directive from the guards that um, that um, uh, you'd have to be trading. Now the old thing of trading was if you opened one day okay. a year and you sold a bottle of stout, that could be seen as trading. Right, okay. That you sold it for a shilling or whatever. Yeah. And uh, you did trade, and they couldn't say you didn't. Yeah. So um, I opened in, I, the old yard was gone wild out there. And so um, myself and a neighbor came up, um, and we dug away the, the grass. There was nearly a, a foot height of grass out there in the yard. And, um, I opened in one night, I think about 1982. Okay. Reopened. Right. And it kind of just just to bring up a few crates of beer in the yeah. the bush of the care. I was living in Torlis at the time. Right. So I didn't come up to live here until 1990. Okay. And uh, over time, it got going. Yeah. Do you know? To put it mildly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so that was the story of it. And I, then when the children came on, you used to always have people singing of course and yeah. um, people got to know of it in over time and yeah people started coming every week from from surrounding areas outlying parishes and then started coming from Farrowfield you know from all over the country yeah and um, from all over Ireland we'd have, you know I had people down there every year they're from Tyrone they come once a year people from Ballycastle in Antrim from everywhere from time to time. You know, Kerry and the south of Ireland, everywhere I'd say. And uh, just word them out. And is it the fact that it's it's just a Thursday night every week that lends itself to a sense of occasion almost? It does, I suppose. And it's away from the weekend as well. Mm. You know. And then we'd an awful lot of uh, tourists from, from abroad. Loads of people from America and uh, whatever way the word went out, they had it on their list to visit it. Mm. Canadians, some big article went over. Someone was here one night. He was from a newspaper in in um, in uh, Ottawa, and uh, he wrote some article, and um, people saw it. And they came. They were telling me after they saw it, and mm. and it went kind of out around that part of Canada. Mm. Not a lot of visitors. So they, if they were visiting Ireland, they made sure to come here. Okay. Australians, New Zealanders, India, everywhere. We've had them all from time to time. But the last two years we've had no yeah. tourists mm. with the whole virus. Mm. Uh, but we have, they open there, the girls open out. The girls are all into the music and they grow up with it now. They listen to it as children and, and they started teaching music there. And they have a lot of good friends now, you know, that know them. Yeah. They're, they're coming on now. Yeah. And, uh, Has that been uh, really pleasing for you to watch? Because I suppose you know you started this and built it up, and you know your five daughters and yourself and Kay started, and your five daughters have come, and there's a whole new generation of not just people but musicians coming through. The oh place yeah, now. yeah, and they're all interested in the music. Mm. It's incredible. You'd say they they want nothing only pop, <laughs> but they still they love the old thread. Yeah, they love the old songs. And now they are singing them themselves, and it's lovely to see the young people. You see youngsters there now. They've in their late teens or early twenties, and they're singing the songs that that the people generations before them, mm. and the seem it seems to be in the blood or something mm. that this thing comes back and becomes part of their lives again. Um, this love of the uh, the the trad stuff and and the Irish songs and of course the folk songs, mm. some great folk songs out there, not all Irish, and yeah. they're singing those again and. There's a, you know, she, her own family were great at the music. And, um, loads of people around her, Pat and Catty and, and the Rhines of the Lion, Joan and our children used to come here. Yourself used to come up 
and you know anyone around that that learned the Stapletons above the Murrays, you know all the people that were interested in the music, mm. and they came here and played a few tunes. And people down from Kilcommon, everywhere, mm. you know around and coming from here, there, and uh, they all added to the whole wood scene. Mm. Great musicians who had some lovely nights here over the years, uh, memorable nights, you know, that will stay long in the memory. Um, what does what does music and singing mean to you? Ah, sure, it means an awful lot. I love the old song myself. Mm -hmm. As I said to you, I grew up listening to people talking about songs and whistling tunes, and you know, this was this. It it made a great. Um, it seemed to be a, a very big part of people's lives. Mm. The music and song when they'd go to relax in the evening. They 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 assume a different therapy almost isn't it? like a therapy. You know. Mm -hmm. They are, they, after coming in after the day's work, and f mostly among rural people, I grew up. And uh, when they sat down in the evening and started to chat and relax, you know, as I said, they talked about everything. But music seemed to invigorate them. Mm. And uh, music and song, they'd assume a, almost a different persona mm. when, they, when they'd hear the song, and it would lift them. Mm. And uh, the majority, not everyone, sang, of course. Not everyone, but the, even those that didn't seem to enjoy it. Mm. And often if people heard an old tune in the radio, it was whished, you know, whished until we hear that. Because mm. the music wasn't so plentiful. Mm. You know, Obertrush was good for the music with the Cayley Band, I suppose, here, and all that. And it kind of held on to it. There wasn't an awful lot of music around Tullus. Right. You know, people, as I said to you, you'd be surprised you went into houses and the next thing is you hear fellas singing opera right. uh, or you know something like Gilbert and Sullivan and, and that there was a certain amount of people who were always interested in that mm. but uh, music seemed to be uh, like a therapy mm. to people it lifted them out of of one sort of um, um, persona mm. or, or feeling or uh, into another you know mm. it seemed to, to, to invigorate people mm in one way or another it is it's part of your life though it's a constant really i'd imagine uh i've seen some great videos of you singing even to your livestock <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> and your crops that was more <laughs> more as Greta's doing Greta, i'd say to me sing a song you know she uh, and and i'd say god i hope you're not doing anything with this and the next thing she'd have it up up on some old I don't follow the, I, I'm not able to handle computers or anything like that at all. But f they seem to, to like to do it, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, she would just go along with them. And uh, I, I know all those old songs so well, Yeah. you know, in my head, that I could think of maybe a song for an occasion. Yeah. You know, uh, often as you get older, you might lose the enthusiasm, but it is all around me here. Yeah. You yeah. know, the girls, they love the music. and Then they, when I used to tell them to listen to someone, you know, older stuff, and then they got to like that themselves. Okay. You know, mm. they got to like, the, I was even telling Carter or Greta to listen to, to Paul Robeson, and to listen to different great um, uh, opera singers. So they'd, they'd Google them, and okay. listen to them, and then they'd get an appreciation of them. Nice. And uh, so I, I like to give them a, an old something like I got growing up. Yeah. That you know that my mother kind of gave that. My I had an aunt Mary who used to play the fiddle too. Uh, my father's sister she used to play the fiddle. So that music was in them too. And my grandmother on my father's side, she used to play the fiddle. There was a travelling teacher going around here long ago, and he came to. He was a Paddy Corbett. It was from Kilrush, uh, down the Rag Road there. And he came up to Upper Church also, I believe. Okay. So he was known as a bandmaster, music teacher. Mm -hmm. And he came around and taught in a, lot, in a lot of houses. So I suppose a lot of people got taught the fiddle, maybe, and the accordion, maybe. Okay. And a concertina, I'd say, I think was a, was a cheap instrument long ago. You could buy them cheaply. Okay. So it, it was a, you know, they'd... I suppose, their love was there. It was in their, it was in their blood almost. 
the love of music and a bit of fun, mm. light-hearted. Well, I was just about to say that. I mean, it's it's obviously a, cent- a centre for music here, and a lot of people come for music and singing. But a lot of people just come from a bit of development as well. Like oh, God, yeah. Don't they? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah there is. There is that expect. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. When they will, when before we were kind of closed up there at the bar, we'd have great nights there. Yeah. They'd be great fun. Yeah. Lads would loosen their self out with a few pints. Yeah. And there'd be great camaraderie and great old crack there. Um, but it's as you know, yeah, as you know, long ago, it often ended up in a row too. <laughs> lads got too merry. Yeah. Uh, when words might flow too much. Yeah. And but yeah, yeah, sure. We do some memorable times here, and hopefully it will go on. Yeah. Do you know? Go on well into the but it's a unique venue though I, I think quite part of the genius of the place is you have the music room yeah and then you have the middle area and then you have the bar area so there's almost three separate compartments <laughs> and three different you, you travel through three worlds you almost. do you do yeah and <laughs> people kind of uh, uh, inhabit them all from time to time they yeah. move through the place yeah yeah Ash, it is, it was, it's been a wonderful a wonderful life here like from that point of view yeah it's been a group, we've had so many wonderful occasions here with, and you know most of the people that come seem to enjoy it and take something from it yeah take a take a, a great sense of satisfaction mm. and happiness away with them and that's that's the crowning thing of the whole lot yeah the, if, when you see that that people go I remember one girl there I might have said this to loads of people the American girl she came here one night must be 20 years ago and she sat there in the window and I was just talking to her after. Him. She said to me, I found myself smiling all night, she says, which isn't something I've done for a long time. Great. She just took grace, she took in the night, she didn't participate. Yeah. But she took in what was going on and she seemed to enjoy it all. Yeah. yeah. You know. And that's all due to the people that came here from near mostly near our local people that sang songs and played music and contributed in every way mm. even the people that never sang because uh, they, they also serve who only stand and wait mm. in a different context <laughs> yeah. and um, um, th- you know everyone that comes the non-participant is as important as the like the yeah. like the crowds at the matches yeah yeah where were the matches when you hadn't the crowds exactly no excitement yeah you know because they're part of the whole team yeah and uh, so you love to see people taking satisfaction, going home with, with, with a, a sense of, of happiness or mm. good feeling, yeah. you know, because uh, I suppose those things are so important to us all yeah. mm. as human beings. To knock a, as the great, you know about the tailor on Anstey, yeah. he says it's only a big bag of wind, <laughs> knock a good kick out of it while you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of good big bags of wind, you must have got some great yarns up at the bar, I say, over the years. Oh, is there sure. any funny stories that stick in the memory more than others? Ah, sure, there are loads of stories. You wouldn't know where to no, begin. No, I, I wouldn't even know where to begin. <laughs> <laughs> there are countless stories. Uh, I remember one night Paddy Purcell here, one of the first nights of the radio, uh, Paddy, Paddy was here, and Eamon Dwyer was the, the local radio, you know. Could be 30 years ago now, and Paddy was here. He was talking, he was going on talking to everyone. The radio was a great excitement at that time. Mm. But now it doesn't seem people nearly want to avoid the radio. Mm. You, I mean, being on it. Yeah, yeah. And because uh, it was a great novelty and the place would be packed there. But Paddy was saying one time about, I might have been telling him that the place gets flooded with the river it come up overboard there. And um, uh, Paddy then was, oh, he says, says Paddy, Jim used to love to see the river, he says, coming in. Don't need chance, he says, he'd get to wash the floor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, sure, Jim used to have great old stories here, too. Yeah. Jimmy the Mill, um, long ago. Yeah. He'd, he had lots of, lots of droll old stories. Yeah. And um, we didn't think much of them, but the more I listen to them now, the more fun I think they are. Yeah. You yeah. know, droll old stories. He used to tell a story about a man in Turles one time, Jack Coleman. Jack, Jack was a character around the town. Right. He used to be there hanging around the market house. And um, one day, there was a man by the name of Tom Stapleton, had a pub there where Tommy Mochlers was after. Now, 
there's a care for just opposite the bank here at this side before Mocklers chemists. That was Hogan's. Hogan's the bus people had that too. Okay. They bought it, but they must have bought it off of Stapleton's. But this Stapleton was an upper church man he was. But one time anyway, this woman you know the pubs that time used to sell crew beans. Big seeds, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, on this occasion this woman she wanted to know did she asked Jack, does Tom Stapleton have pig's feet? And Jack, of course, thought for a second he was a brilliant man, so he brilliant in the mind, so he just said, Be God, ma'am, he says, I never saw him with his boots off. <laughs> <laughs> Jack was a character around Tullis. Uh, he was out at Knox's one morning, he used to go to Snearden. You know, the people would go, as I told you, like Nigo Connors, out yeah. catching rabbits. And so they were out in Knox's, out in British. And of course, they had an old gamekeeper out there. And he was watching that there was no intruders. So Jack was caught one morning, anyway, in the, on the, in the farm or the estate. And uh, your man says to him, what are you doing in here? Don't you see, you, you, you cannot uh, trespass on this property. Tr property. So that's an awful question, he says, to ask a man this hour of the morning, says Jack. An awful question to ask a man. And what are you doing here? He says to the, the gamekeeper. Well, he says, I'm out here, he says, to, to a kind of go around the property and see that everything is all, uh, all right and there's no one trespassing or anything like that. Yeah. And he says, but mainly, he says, I'm out, he says, to get an appetite for my breakfast, to inhale the fresh air. Yeah. Now, says he, tell me what you're doing here. Well, to tell you the truth, says Jack, what I'm out here for mainly, he says, is to get a breakfast for my appetite. <laughs> <laughs> and spe speaking of crew beans and appetites, whatever about crew beans, uh, there's never been a short of black pudding here anyway. Oh, yeah, the night. old black pudding used to... The old black pudding went down very well. Yeah. Yeah, it did. Uh, um, black pudding and a bit of brown bread. Yeah. And, uh, oh, God, yeah, that was a great favourite. Mm. But, of course, we haven't done it now for a while because of... We weren't open, shop. Sure. Have you missed it now? Ah, we have. We have, yeah. We have mm. missed it. But it, you know what? There's a share of people now and they won't eat black pudding or white pudding. But there's a, they, there's a share of people going away like from from that traditional thing, you know, yeah. the vegetarians and yeah. the vegans. And there is a change in the, in the, I think, in, I suppose, the majority are still, still yeah. like it, you know. And then the the, the the Yanks and all them know, the most of them would eat it, and, uh, and uh, most of them would eat it. And of course, the crowd, the voracious crowd about the bear, the local men, they'd clean it off <laughs> <laughs> all the time. They have, they have no quims about yeah. what they 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 wouldn't be too particular about about those things. Has, you know, in all your years here, has the human condition changed much? I mean, where some things might change and you've maybe more vegans than you once did. Yeah. Or do some things stay very much the same? Or yeah, sure they do. I even see the young people. Do you know what? Mm. They're the same as the people that went before. Mm. If, you, if, you, if you kind of analyse them, really. Mm. And in many cases, they try to imitate. Right. They might lose it for a few years in their... In their teenage years mm. but when they go on then into their 20s they nearly like to say the same old speaks that they heard the people before them yeah but there are sons and daughters of their forefathers yeah so like breeding britain on on dochus and mock and quit and they're the same you know generally speaking people i think they they inherit certain characteristics and it breaks out in them mm. People, I think tradition is a very important thing. Mm. Uh, I knew houses are different. Uh, people, we grew up with an open fire in Siskin, you know, and the Whalens had an open fire, the Hades had an open fire, the Tierneys. Some of the people had moved on to Cookers. But uh, it was a different sort of a life, and people didn't mind. They might complain about the cold. Or mm. The houses weren't kind of insulated like they are now. Sometimes you'd have to open the door of it, depending on the on the the blowing of the wind. The smoke would come back down the chimney. Many of the old chimneys were bad. 
Right. So people would often have to open the back door of a, of a cold night and they'd be sitting around the fire mm. with, with, a, with a top coat on it. <laughs> but do you know what? And you know, um, people seemed to endure that. or They didn't seem to, it, it wasn't an endurance. They just kind of took it on as part of life. Mm. And they didn't mind it, you know. And transport wasn't there. Only the old horse and care for most people until they, the cares didn't come in for most people in the 70s. Mm. People hadn't a motor care. So it was mostly walking, walking to mass for most people. Then money seemed to, when people, I, for rural communities anyway, the money seemed to flow after joining the EEC to farming. Milk went up about double in a few years. Right. And farmers began to get to prosper. And there were some great years there. You know, I, people, I said it to Amanda the other day, I remember people wouldn't have the price of a tin of paint to paint a door. Right. But they just lived away. That wasn't the priority, mm. you know. The women would have, lo have, definitely, would have loved to have something better. Because for cooking and better houses, they all, the men weren't as, as bothered about things like that. Yeah. They'd nearly rather build a cow house right. than put on a, a new room. Yeah. In many ways, that wasn't the, you know, it was improving kind of, they thought of buying a bit of land or yeah. building a new shed or something like that. That was, they were the priorities in, in, in many rural houses. And when you talk about tradition and the importance of tradition, is that, do you think, one of the secrets of success or the reason people love coming here? They're sort of plugging into the tradition, the tradition of music, tradition of the open fire even that's yeah. still here. Uh, that it, This is almost like a, I don't know if real Ireland is the right word, but a, a type a of A throwback. Ireland. Yeah, throwback, yeah. Yeah, yeah, they do, they do, they love that. Mm. They love and you'd, you'd often meet people who might. Now, you know, most people, I suppose anyone under 60, they nearly, they never saw, they might have seen an open fire, but particularly under 50s anyway, most people had cookers and housing conditions were beginning to improve. We had no toilets, none of the houses around had toilets in my time, mm. you know. So like, there's a huge difference came into life. From, they grew up then, most of the younger generation, but they do love that throwback to the, they can see, it, I suppose it is a kind of an image of the way people did live. Mm. Their flag floor, mm. um, um, the old open heart, um, the dresser maybe is still in there, the old dresser. And it was a different way of life, the half door. It kind of is a replica of a life a hundred years ago. Mm. And people, I think, maybe experience that feeling. And they love it, and all the youngsters will tell you that. Mm. God, this is lovely, and, and to see that and to experience it. Mm. But I feel, it, as I said to you a few minutes ago, there's little change in the heart of people. Mm. The heart of people is more or less, and probably you'll, you're a young man, but you'll see as you, as you go to, along through life too, you know, we, we set different standards and ideals for ourselves as we, we, we begin to, to kind of change our mind about the, the, the flush of youth is over. Mm. People begin to kind of consider things and what's important. But the youth, to see the youngsters that come there even to Cart and Greta there and to Aaron there learning music or to Anya, whoever they're coming to, you know, they seem to they seem to carry that old kind of, the, um, I don't know how you describe it. They seem to carry the mantle of, the, of their predecessors, of their, mm. the generations that went before them. Mm. You know, that there is really, essentially, there's no change in the people, mm. in, the, in their soul and heart. And they're looking for something. Uh, there, you know, people, there's so many, I see the girls in there, they have all these books about psychology and self-help. Mm. People are looking for something that was never available. Mm. And maybe it was available to people in a different way. Mm. You know, with, with um, a connection maybe. You see, long ago too, 
there were grandmothers, grandfathers in the house, and the, the, the generational thing, I suppose, wasn't as strong. Mm. Um, is isn't as strong now because they're not grown up in that environment. Mm. But many of them, the houses where they were brought up, there was a grandmother still there, not as much grandfathers. They seemed to die younger, or they were older when they married, or whatever. But they left a, a great impression, and gave them a sense of 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 life. Mm. Uh, I, I think a very important transmitted something, some uh, sincerity and uh, a decent way of living. You know, give them a, um, a mode for life. Mm. And, and in a way, I was here last week and um, you have the outdoor area in the barn now and it just struck me, you're talking about there's different generations there. That's always been the case here in the middle. So the younger people are and the older people and everyone in between are all together. So what you're talking about there, I suppose, that transfer of respect and knowledge yeah. sort of happens here organically as well, doesn't it? It does, it does, yeah. And you'd hope that, you know, there is, that is there. And it does transfer. You know, it is nice to meet someone who's kind of, who will give respect to the youth and vice versa. Mm. You know, a mutual kind of a thing, mm. and they see it, and I think, I think it goes into their mind. You know, it pervades people when they mm. see something, and, and it can be a life changer, a, a mini life changer. Mm. You know, to observe people, good kind of, good kind of characteristics in people, mm. and um, I think those things kind of do transmit from one, from one generation to another, and if they see it there and. You know, it, it takes the rowdiness. An old night like that, mm. it's kind of, it's soft and uh, gentle, and it is um, invigorating um, from a, a cultural point of view. Mm. I think that goes into people, um, you know, and, and it's very important facets of their uh, of their being, mm. and I, I just transfer and people mix together, we have all ages out there, and they do mix, and there's a smile on their face, and, you know, we hope it has some effect on on, on, on them all. We'd like to think that. Yeah, I was just about to ask you, um, you must be very proud of what you've created here, and what will continue, because the girls are obviously bringing it on again to another level now, knowing that there's an incredible legacy there. I hope. I don't think of being proud, you know that way, John. Maybe pride is the wrong word, but yeah, I don't, satisfaction, I don't think quite there satisfaction. Is, there is a quite satisfaction in it. You'd love to see it, and, and uh, I do. I, I, I love to go out there now and see people, you know, meet them there along, up the middle room, as you call it, the male room, we call that. You used to store all mail there long ago. And uh, up in, and mostly people, they have a happy countenance about them. Mm. It seems to... To, you know, from no matter where they're from, it's, if it's abroad or they come from abroad, and they they leave with a, with a, with with a, a feeling of better maybe than they came in the door. Mm. Some innate thing that you can't quantify, mm. and um, you'd always hope that it will be it will have an impact in some way. When they come, they'll have a good experience they'll enjoy what's here. And I like to think that we'd leave some sort of a legacy. Mm. Yeah. And in all your time here, observing the human condition, and yeah. is there, and any time I've seen you here, you've always in good form, like, you know, is there, everyone's different, but as you've gone through life, is there anything that you've figured out maybe helps with happiness? Or is there any, any there's no such thing as a secret, but is there any fundamentals maybe? They save, save people the price of a self-help book that you're talking about. <laughs> uh, John, I haven't the secret. But we grew up kind of, grew up kind of with a, with a kind of, a careless attitude to life. Yeah. Never took it too seriously, and they kind of held that as much as possible. Yeah. And I suppose, um, I won't say the drink, a few drinks isn't any harm to anyone. Mm. Maybe you've done a lot of harm to some people. But um, in moderation, I suppose. Um, I don't think, um, I think maybe, Barry, you have an awful kind of um, bad experience. You kind of, you hold on to your personality. Mm. And uh, 
there's something very bad happens to change your black in your black in your life and things do happen to people that kind of can impact on their life greatly sad events or you know um, and they do they've happened to myself like I mean when my father died and my mother died they were kind of and people I knew well you know they're all kind of things that impact and make you but you then the other things kind of you have to get on with life and it isn't that you have to get on with life mm-hmm. but over time you know and you see no more young people and they're full of joy and that impacts upon you then again and takes away the sad moments mm. and hopefully like you know we can't we can't lose sight of our spirit and our will to live it's the most important thing mm. and the old joy that I grew up with you know the joy of our youth was a very important thing to us we had great old times and I, I mean most people can say that Mm. Bear they had very bad experiences in their lives mm. and I think they stand to you and they, they stick with you and then maybe you'd like to you might be outgoing and uh, greet people and uh, you hope that those things will do something for them as well mm. you know to be outgoing and cheerful mm. even if you weren't too cheerful mm. to be cheerful to others it kind of it's a, it kind of gives off an aura or something that might lessen the load for some people. Mm. That's all I think of it, John. Mm. I don't think of it deeply. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. I've never thought it was caught now. We were just discussing there books she was reading there. You know, all this psychology and uh, the, she, she was talking about the stress, stress in life. Mm. It can cause. It's one of the great causes of illness, and if you if you could avoid it, mm. and some people seem to be tied up, them you know, misfortunately, they seem to be always kind of caught up in in stress and hardship. It's like as if it is nearly imposed upon themselves mm. from merely in their life, and they they find it very hard to break away from it. More people then. The cares of life seem don't seem to bother them, mm. you know. So I mean, it's very, very hard to explain. But you're happy with your lot, anyway. Hello, we are. So I suppose another old thing went to stray now and again, you know, John. Yeah. But I suppose you don't dwell on those. Mm. Kind of dismiss them and put them, put them to the, the the least corner of your mind. And as a man who has a song for every moment and every occasion, is. Uh, is there any song that comes to mind when you sum up, when you think of what you've created here and the happiness you've had with your with Kay and your five daughters and all the rest? Any happy song to finish with? God, John, you're putting me on the spot there now. <laughs> any happy song? Yeah, sure, we've, we've, I suppose, lots of little happy songs, John. Uh, uh, could I think of one at Or any favourite song of yours? That could I think of one uh, if I was trying to... Oh, sure, I have loads of favourite songs. Uh, John, I like um, I like uh, a lot of the old, even Sigerson Slifford, the great song he had uh, of um, uh, Cahar Saivin, you know, the town it climbs the mountain, the boys of Barna Shrada. Um, that's a great song I love because it depicts the life of young fellas and growing up and, you know, it's kind of a seemingly a carefree attitude to life too. I might sing you a verse to that. Yeah. The town it climbs the mountain and looks upon the sea. In waking or in sleeping time, tis there I'd long to be. To walk again those kindly streets, the place my life began. With those boys of born who oh, hunted for the land. With our cudgel stout, we roamed about in search of the drolling. We'd search for birds in every furs, from litter to dunin. We jumped for joy beneath the sky, life held not print nor plan. 
and we boys in barn shroyde, hunting farther and and when the hills were bleeding and the rifles were aflame to the rebel homes of Kerry those Saxon strangers came but the men who fought the Oxy and brave the black and tan were once spies in Barnishroyd, hunting farther and. So here's a hell to them tonight, the boys who laughed with me. By the groves of Carron River are the slopes of Venity. John Dolly and Bat Andy, the Sheehan's Con and Dan, and those boys of Barnishroyde who hunted for the run. And now they tile on foreign soil where they have gone their way, deep in the heart of London town or over on Broadway and I am left to sing their deeds to praise them while I can those boys of Barnishroyd who hunted for the run and when the wheel of life turns down and peace comes over me just lay me down near that old town between the hills and sea i'll take my sleep neath those green fields the place my life began with those boys of Barnishrod who hunted far the run. Lovely stuff, Jim. Thanks, Thanks a million. Thanks, John. Long live Jim in the world. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Mighty Thanks. stuff. Thank, thank you. John.